This podcast is about introducing our fans to the animals, plants, and other products that we work with at Josh's Frogs. It's an opportunity to paint a picture of our hobby that is refreshing. We want you guys to be successful with the animals that you're keeping, and we want our hobby to grow ethically and sustainably into the future. Welcome to the Josh's Frogs podcast. I have my guest here, Zach, at Josh's Frogs. But before we get to him, I just want to plug a commercial. Right now, the Josh's Frogs podcast is, is sponsored by Josh's Frogs. We're your one-stop shop for all your feeder insects, live plants, live reptiles and amphibians, and all the supplies you need to take care of them. Uh, with our how-to guides, blogs, articles, videos, we take care of you from before you're ready to purchase all the way through to when you have those tough questions when you're taking care of your animals. We're here for you. So without further ado, let me welcome you, welcome Zach to the show. Zach, tell me a little bit about yourself. Like, How did you come to work at Josh's Frogs? How did you get hired here, and, and what's your role here? Well, um, I was actually a, a customer of yours before I was an employee when I, uh, I grew up down in South Texas, um, was going to school at University of North Texas in Denton and living with a girlfriend at the time and nearly kicked me out of her smelly fruit fly culture. So she went online, found your fruit fly media at the time. I think that was 2004, 2005, said it smelled like fresh cinnamon bread, still smells like fresh cinnamon bread. Um, bought that stuff for me, uh, around 07, I moved up here to continue my degree at Michigan state. You were about operating out of your, your garage and basement at that time. We're about 40 minutes away. My fruit flies for my dart frogs didn't make the trip. So on day two of me being a Michigander, I drove out to your place, um, hosted some local frog events. I used to be a moderator on Dender Board long ago. One of the more, uh, used to be one of the more popular online dart frog forums. And, um, you know, and after a while you asked me to quit my other jobs and come work for you doing shows and here I am. That's awesome. That's awesome. So talk about a little bit, what, what was your breeding experience, animal experience before that? Like, what, what did you do growing up as a kid and, and into college? What are some yeah. of the things that you worked um, with? Growing up, I had like really bad asthma and allergies at a young age. Um, hair was not out of the question. We had a dog, but we had to be really careful with it, have a lot of filters. So things that had scales or soft, squishy skin were just better fits. Um, I got my first reptile when I was, was four or five. We had a neighbor working on a Cub Scout badge and was keeping a snake alive as part of that. It was a big old um, eastern ribbon snake, and it gave birth to 60-some-odd live babies and got to take one of those home. It was Ryan, a ribbon snake, and he lived about 14 or 15 years. Um, just worked with various reptiles, amphibians, and, and fish. Um, I think they're closely related uh, since then. Um, and through college, I actually paid for most of my college degree just by breeding various reptiles, amphibians, dart frogs, did a lot of bearded dragons, um, Europlatus or leaf tail geckos from Madagascar were my specialty for a number of years, you know, things like that. Cool. Cool. And then when you started working for Josh's frogs, we had you doing shows and talk about doing shows and then talk about the other roles that you took until you got to your current role. Cool. Yeah. So you stuck me on shows. I'm good at talking. That probably had something to do with it. <laughs> um, it started doing local shows on the weekends, which worked really well. I was working on my biology degree for Michigan state, um, as well as maintaining a couple other jobs. Um, and then as stuff changed, we got busier, um, sure your wife loved the news when you decided to move out of your house finally and get a place um, about half a mile away from where we're at currently out here in Owasso. And uh, you talk, I remember you talking to me being like, hey, I need help with stuff around the shop. Can you work for me for 40 hours? Can you quit your other jobs? I was like, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> and so we, uh, we took the plunge and did that. So for a while I did all of our, like, well, not all of our, we were always doing a lot of that stuff together, uh, customer service, um, you know, packing orders, a whopping 30 orders on a Monday. I remember those days. And sometimes I still didn't get them all out in time for FedEx pickup. Um, you know, stumbled into new product creation, taking care of the animals. As we grew, we started breeding a lot more stuff in um, and going from there um, and just really, you know, growing that over time. Um, I remember, I think it was in 09 or 2010, maybe you asked me, hey, do you want to be a manager? And I'm like, Sure, what's that? And, um, you know, kind of started learning how to do that, um, led the animal teams as we grew, and eventually added on a second building. Um, since then, I've overseen, um, you know, animals was always my primary focus, then insects, then plants, and now that includes shipping and receiving and customer service and um, production, as well as new all of our new product creation here. 
Cool, cool. So your role here is the VP of operations. So you're in charge of kind of like all of our operations from how we are breeding stuff to how we are getting it to our customers. Um, and then overseeing customer service as, a, as an aspect of that as well, too. Can you talk about each one of those teams and kind of give like a, a short snippet of like, what are those teams doing? Like, what are the teams that are underneath of you? And go even a couple layers down. Talk about yeah. each one of those teams. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's start off in, uh, with our Duran location, which is about 20 minutes away from here. Um, it uh, used to be an old Carter's IGA supermarket. It's about 35,000 square feet, and that is where our shipping team resides that packs those orders and gets them out to our customers in a timely fashion, make sure the right things goes out to them. Um, you know, we have our receiving team, which takes in incoming orders, make sure those are stocked and maintains our inventory. Um, our production team, which actually a lot of our Josh's Frogs uh, branded goods, um, it's kind of cool, especially at our scale, that we're still making a lot of that stuff here on site, um, you know. A lot of times per bag, you know, if you bought a bag of bio bedding from us, somebody literally put all those ingredients in the bag at once. Um, maybe John, the head of a production or, you know, Shane or Rachel or Adam or any of the employees over there um, got them out to you. Um, then also over there, we have our insect order fulfillment team, which um, any of the feeder insects that we purchase in, we repackage, we make sure they're the quality we want. Um, they're, uh, you know, properly packaged and then hand it off to the shipping team to get to our customers. Um, over here in Owasso, we of course have customer service, you know, to a lot of people, that's going to be the, the people they interact with led the Ariana, um, you know, and they're in charge of making sure, uh, you know, customers are informed and are, you know, in some cases, even talking to the right people. If somebody has a question about an animal, they can't ask, you know, we can get you right to the curator that's in charge of overseeing that animals project here. Um, and also just making sure our customers are well taken care of, um, helping them place orders, connecting to the website. And if something goes wrong, you know, making sure they're aware, you know, hey, you're covered under our guarantees and, you know, working out that resolution. Um, you know, we also on the, um, the live side, um, you know, well, it's kind of linked in with customer service too. We have our vertebrate shipping team, the people that actually receive animals from our different production teams and then pack them uh, downstairs and make sure those get out the door. Um, that also includes some receiving duties, uh, led by Seth over here, um, with a separate building, receiving orders and such and communicating with Durand. Um, we have our plant team, uh, currently led by Sam, um, and they're, you know, take care of thousands and thousands of live plants and grow them out, bring them through quarantine, make sure they're potted, make sure those orders are filled. Um, some of those orders actually get sent over to Duran so the plants can go with the insect and dry goods that are ordered on the same order. Um, you know, our insect team, which breeds a lot of really cool just feeder insects, as well as a lot of really neat um, cleanup crew. We work with every legal isopod you can in the U.S., um, you know, millipedes, um, new projects like vampire crabs, some other freshwater crabs. Even we're taking a jab at breeding hermit crabs, which is really exciting, um, led by Phil and Marie. Um, and then, of course, we have the animal team, uh, led by Anthony. Um, we have our dart frog department, led by Brandon and Olivia, who, you know, produce right now around four to 500 dart frogs a week and oversee every care aspect of their life stage, planning, retirement of breeders, um, distribution and care. Um, a reptile team led by Nikki who just lead a lot of different branches of, um, you know, our reptile department and um, a lot of new exciting uh, species that we're wanting to try to make a little more common again, like um, shield tail agamas, uh, dwarf monitors, as well as uh, bread and butters like crested geckos and such. Um, Austin, who leads our tree frog and toad department, which are one of the same, which produce, you know, thousands of white tree frogs and many other species. Um, you know, and lastly, but not leastly, um, you know, uh, Jason with the, um, with our, we call it our, arachnid department now so focusing on you know primarily tarantulas and going to get those to our customers let's dial into one of the teams let's pick um let's pick reptiles what are the reptiles that we're breeding and then how do we choose which which species we're working with and which ones we aren't like how do, how do we do that so what are we working with now and then how do we make decisions on who or what we're going to work with in the yeah, future cool um so we're working with a you know quite a lot of different um reptiles i know we got really excited we have some pretty uncommon cave gecko species that are starting to produce recently um you know our common uh, chinese cave geckos uh ganiurosaurus haniensis are a really awesome species um, that we're going to be investing and continue to invest in producing those really high demand animal um like a lot of animals initially their demand is being fed by wild caught trade um, so that's a species that breeds readily in captivity, makes it really easy to keep captive. They do well in a bio, uh, bioactive setup. Um, pretty straightforward to breed. Um, actually tolerate being handled pretty well, which, you know, a lot of animals don't, but these guys are really good fit. And they're small enough where, you know, anybody in almost any living condition could take care of them properly their entire lifespan. 
Um, so those are some of the things we look at. We um, Animals and projects get bonus points. Um, if there's already a little bit of information known um, about how to breed them, if we don't have to go in blind, which sometimes we do. And it's also some of the funnest part of the job. But, you know, sometimes we got to figure that out. Um, and then also, like, if there's a demand for them that we've already identified, especially if we can kind of counter some of those wild-caught imports, too. Cool. Um, yeah. Cool. You mentioned um, wild-caught animals. We're a captive-bred uh, mm -hmm. uh, facility. In, in the, the reptile industry, like, I think there's less uh, wild-caught animals coming in when it, as opposed to when you look at the frog industry. Like, can you talk a little bit about, like, why we chose captive-bred in the reptile industry and, and what that means for us moving forward, what we will work with and what we won't work with? Yeah. Um, um, I think we just wanted to make our life a lot more difficult early on. No, that's not at all. Um, but we just wanted to, you know, make sure we could grow our hobby in an ethical and sustainable way. Um, you know, way back in the day, you know, I have a lot of adventure books I read as a kid about explorers in like the 20s and 30s and animal collectors. And it was at that point, like nature was this giant resource. You could do whatever you wanted to it. It was unlimited. It'd grow back. You weren't going to hurt it. We people couldn't do that. Um, I know when we started, it was really more of a um, uh, let's do let's do net neutral. Let's have it to where if we're by people, you know, keeping these frogs in glass boxes at home, it's not harming any wild populations like we're we're winning. And I love that as we've grown, we've really changed towards that net positive. Like there needs to be a benefit to those wild populations and animals in those wild um, by people keeping these as pets. So we've done that with our conservation initiatives where we have grants every year. Um, we've partnered with um, several different specific research projects. Um, or uh, people working with these animals. So the sales from these animals at Josh's Frogs directly benefits them in the wild. Um, and I think that's just like part of the solution to a much more sustainable hobby, both in we're not harming wild populations, but also we have a lot more control biosecurity wise over um, the spread of unknown diseases. I'm sure that's fresh on everyone's mind with you know COVID and everything too. Yeah. Um, you know, just making sure that things like ronavirus or B-sal, uh, salamander chytrid fungus, um, aren't being passed around in the yeah. trade. Um, and you know, we just have a lot more control over that. So they're not getting out into the environment and causing further damage. Cool. Cool. Talk a little bit about our tree frog department, uh, switching to them. What, what are they working with? What, what are the plans in the future? Yeah. Um, how we choose which species to work with, which species we shouldn't work with. How, how do you guys make those decisions? Yeah. Tree frogs is really, really cool. Um, it, especially the fact that, um, working with uh, Austin and, um, and, the, and Anthony, um, a lot of the animals we breed there, um, they aren't produced in mass. Like a lot of the animals we work with in the reptile department, there there's other people breeding them consistently in large numbers here or there. Um, you know, they're already established. In tree frogs, there's a demand for captive bred animals, but there's not that supply a lot of times. Um, a good exception would probably be like white tree frogs. But um, red-eyed tree frogs are a great example of that. Like everybody knows what a red-eyed tree frog looks like. A lot of people, it was their first pet frog. Um, you know, tens of thousands of those are imported every year from the wild. Um, we've brought in wild caught founder populations for freeders before that have been riddled with parasites and various diseases and stuff that we've been able to contain and control. But, um, you know, that's just whenever you're bringing in wild caught animals, it's a risk. So being able to look at there and identify kind of a hole in, um, supply, at least on a captive red market with an animal who's, um, just, um, you know, their, uh, how they, their mode of reproduction, this is an animal that you could breed it easily twice a year that could produce, you know, 80 to 120 offspring at a time. Like you can scale out really well. Um, also with a lot of the large toads, um, you know, they're almost challenging on the other end of the spectrum because you're successful and then you have 10,000 of them and then it's like, okay. Um, but a lot of those animals, um, they're awesome. They're traditionally brought in as these big wild caught adults that you put in your enclosure. They bounce around. They're not used to being contained. Um, captive bred animals just behave a lot differently. Um, and they're, you know, for a frog or a toad, like a lot of the big toads are really personable. It's more along the kind of like, almost like a dog than... You know, something that you just look at that's pretty. Um, but identifying a lot of holes in there, I think one of our big ones there would be yellow spotted climbing toads, which I think we have just over 800 of them out right now. Um, the team's done a great job raising those out. We're really excited to get those back in the hobby. Um, over the years, we received, um, I think it's around nine wild caught individuals in our collection. And from them, we've been able to take that to about uh, about twelve to 15,000 captive bred animals. So it really just allows you to find those niches and scale and that many more people get to experience animals. And plus it's a positive experience because they're healthy and captive bred. Yeah, I think that's one of the cool things I like about, especially the tree frog department, that, you know, in, when it comes to the hobby, we're replacing wild caught animals with much better 
captives by producing captive bred animals that don't have some of the issues that you have when you're importing animals. I think we're, we're in, in essence, improving the hobby. And I think that's really cool what you guys are doing. Um, let's go to the dart frog team. Tell me a little bit about what they're working with, what they focus on, what are some of the new projects coming up and, and how we decide which dart frogs we're going to, we're going to yeah. work with. Um, it's really cool, especially with dart frogs being that we do produce them at like a fairly large scale. We've really been able to dial and continue to dial in their husbandry and such over time. Um, there's a lot of demand for a lot of the more common dart frogs. And as um, you know, in the past, they were viewed as something that was incredibly difficult to care for. Because there are these big wild caught animals that were, you know, collected in the, in the rainforest. And then a month later, they get to you. They're not healthy. They're hard to keep. Maybe they're still slightly toxic. You know, all, all captive red dart frogs, of course, are harmless. But those wild caught ones, that wasn't the case. Um, and just looking at those and identifying where that demand is, especially as a lot of, um, you see dart frogs to become more common in like your mom and pop stores. You know, it used to be such a rarity to walk into a pet store and you see dart frogs there. Um, and now that's just becoming a lot more common with advances in husbandry and care and just understanding. And, you know, a healthy captive bred inch long animal is just easier to keep and easier to be successful with. Um, you know, looking at those, uh, you know, we are expanding constantly. Uh, currently, we're working with, I, th I believe it's right around 80 some odd different localities and species of darts. Um, some really exciting things are coming out of our partnership with Sam Sucre out of Panama, where we're figuring out what it looks like to introduce dart frogs through completely legal channels, um, bred in captivity in a biosecure facility in Panama, exported here, then produced in the United States. Um, and then distributed uh, just a cool way to get new species, um, you know, into the pet trade. We've seen some other um, other companies over the years like Tesoros de Colombia or, um, you know, um, what's the one in Ecuador? Um, With Kiri. There Wikiri, we go. Yeah. Sorry, guys. I wanted to make sure I didn't leave anybody out that was at the tip of my tongue. Or even in the past, in Ibico. Um, yeah. And like sustainable ways that those animals can be brought in that then actually benefit the conservation. A lot of that money stays in the country of origin, which I think is really important. And it's a cool way just to get um, new animals into the hobby. And it's actually part of learning about those animals and conserving those animals. Um, there's some really neat stuff in the pipeline there. Um, as well as just seeing like a lot of times it's just matters. We work with such a variety of animals. What are we selling out of constantly? Or what are we hearing people ask us about? Um, we don't tend to go and chase like the, the newest thing as soon as it comes in. Um, and just, you know, let that get established, but we're all really, really excited to also work out what does it look like introducing a new species or a new locale into the hobby in a way that you can get the most benefit to that species or locale in the wild too. Cool. Um, I know with, uh, we're working with various morse of Ufaga Vicente from Panama, which is really cool. On uh, some of these, it was the, the first like 100% directly from Panama legal imports um, from some of these po specific populations. And funds from that were actually used to establish the first um, in situ, so in nature, um, amphibian breeding like and conservation project that Panama's ever seen before. That's just really cool to be able to help with that. Yeah, yeah. All right, we're going to tiptoe into some uh, maybe controversial uh, waters, but we got to set it up first. So can you give us an idea of like scale? Like give us an idea of like how many people are involved in breeding mm -hmm. here, animals, and what, what are, give us some of the numbers or something like that. Give us an idea of like the scale of, of production that we're doing here at Josh's Frogs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if I'm going to quantify that way, um, your average production team, like um, our smallest team currently is arachnids at two. Um, we do have some production teams that are, you know, in that, that six, seven, eight person range is pretty typical full-time employees, 40 hours a week. Um, you know, if we look at the, the space, um, you know, we're, this building we're in right now is about 60,000, 65,000, 66,000 square feet. I think, um, you know, currently, you know, probably close to about 20,000 square feet of that space is animal production. And that's, um, quarantine that is, um, you know, our raising out holdbacks that is maintaining our breeders that is tadpole space that is rearing offspring space that is rearing, holding animals for sale and everything um this year we're on track to produce uh right between 120 to 140,000 animals that's a lot of animals 120,000 to 140,000 that's where people start talking about uh they throw on the term puppy mill maybe oh, yes. PETA uses the word puppy mill can you talk a little bit about quality and how we maintain quality when we're producing 120 to 140,000 animals? How do we maintain that quality and, and why should we be breeding this many animals? Yeah. Well, and when you think about a puppy meal, first off, we work with frogs, not dogs. So there's the obvious. <laughs> but when you think about a puppy meal, not only is it's the it's it's quality. They're producing a lot of animals. That's the first thing. Well, they're producing a lot of animals. Josh's frogs is producing a lot of animals, therefore, and it doesn't work out. Like quality. Um, and also there also something to keep in mind is they're producing animals that there's not the demand for. 
They're producing animals because they can make a buck at it, but you could easily go to a shelter. Um, you could go to a specialized breeder who really invests in those animals um, for it instead of going to that puppy mill and getting a cheaper, lower quality animal. Um, they're concerned about producing a lot of offspring. They're not concerned about the uh, you know genetics. They're not concerned about the longevity of that animal or its its quality of life. Um, and those are things we take into consideration too. They're also, you know, being that they do with crowded conditions, they're generally dirtier, um, you know, in puppy mills, like, you know, parasites and viruses and things like that. And those are things we all screen for, um, and treat for. And we have regular cleanliness packages, uh, you know, practices. Every single task here has a standard operating procedure that employees are trained on and followed and tested on and held accountable to, to ensure that things are done consistently the way they need to be just to maintain that level of quality of animals, just for cleanliness and growth rates, um, you know, that they're, they are, you know, free of chytrid and ronavirus and, you know, your common internal parasites. Um, the genetically, they're diverse. Um, you know, we take a lot of steps to track bloodlines and do inbreeding. I know back in, I think it was 2017 when the amphibian decodate ban hit, I mean, it was 2018, but you can, somebody can check me out. The pandemic. There. I'm sure somebody <laughs> will write in it if it's a big deal. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, I know beyond it before the pandemic, it was well, <laughs> PD. Um, you know, uh, when, uh, the caught eight ban happened and it was fearful, there was rumors that that was going to extend to all amphibians. A lot of people ran out there and, you know, grabbed expensive stuff. And we looked at our collection and we're like, what would we not be able to keep around for the next 50 years? And so we worked with, um, you know, some collectors and brought in two or three pairs, um, you know, fairly low, low numbers of a lot of things of different common species of tinctoria dart frogs and things that we knew weren't managed genetically well in the trade so that we'd be able to do so. So we're worried about genetic quality. We're worried about quality of life. We're worried about them rearing well. That's why we don't sell animals. We have minimum sizes, minimum body conditions, and minimum ages for all the animals we sell so we can ensure that what we're sending out is right. Um, you know, and we stand behind that. Um, you know, I don't think anybody's ever um, gotten something from us and then, like, had trouble getting back a hold of us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that's the big difference. Yep. Talk a little bit. Of, you talked about quality and, and the uh, inside of Josh's Frogs and how we monitor that. Like, what's our quality guarantee to customers and to our partners that we work with? Like, how do we, how do we manage that? And um, talk a little bit about um, that and, and, and how we honor that. Well, cool. so we have our written policy and then we have our unwritten policy. <laughs> and so... Yeah, I don't know if this is too behind the scenes or anything. So for a written policy with animals, uh, you know, we have a seven-day guarantee. Um, you know, you get that animal if it does not eat, if it does not look perfect, if it was harmed during shipping. Um, you know, if it just through no fault of your own, that animal is not perfect or what you expect, you know, we, we take care of you. We replace the animal, cover return shipping, um, you know, exchange. We're very, very careful about scheduling shipping. So we look at the weather um, both on our end and on the customer's end, and we pack very, very carefully. We have um, we use inch-thick foam, which is double what a lot of people do, and it's double the industry standard. Um, we use gel. We use our own phase change material, heat or cold packs. Um, in some conditions, we make sure a FedEx hold for pickup is required. Um, you know, and there's just a lot of communication with customers around shipping animals, even if we're sending out several hundred animal orders a week, like even when it gets busy, we don't treat that any differently or in any importance. And that's if somebody's buying one animal from us or somebody's buying a thousand, yep. um, you know, internally, if we work with a customer, say somebody gets a frog from us and, you know, on that profile that they purchase that frog out on our site, when they go to click the button, add it to the cart, it has all their care needs. There's care sheets. We even have a physical care sheet that shipped with that animal. But let's say something does go wrong and they mess up a little bit. Um, they, maybe they don't keep an eye on humidity like they need to. If they call in and something happens with the animal and we're able to work without them and identify what goes wrong and they're able to show us that they fix it and they understand and able to do that, um, we're dedicated to working with them, to helping them out. And sometimes that looks like, Hey, you know, show us that you fixed it. Let's be on the same page about now, you know, you have every position to be success. And oftentimes we'll just replace that animal for them. Um, just to make sure, you know, they're, they're having that good experience. We want them to have a good experience with these animals. Um, um, you know, learn from it and then be in the hobby for a long time. Yeah. So. You um, outlined a lot of the ethical reasons for why um, we want to produce quality animals and why mm -hmm. we want to take care of our uh, customers. It's kind of interesting that there's also like a business case for like people having success with animals. You oversee some of the, the shipping department. Can you give us a, an idea of scale of like what percentage of our sales are animals and what percentage of our sales are actually the other stuff that so, people need to take care of? Animals? Very briefly, <laughs> if you look at this, um, you know, uh, we generally send out a couple hundred to a few hundred animal packages a week, um, you know, to different customers. Uh, last week we shipped uh, just over 5,000 packages, and that would consist uh, out of Durand, and that would have consisted of dry goods, insects, 
or it could consist of a combination of those or live plants. And then there were um, hundreds of orders of live plants coming out of our Owasa location too. So if we look at that in proportion, you're looking at a couple few hundred to, you know, over 5,000. So it really is just telling a lot of those people getting set up. A lot of those are feeder insects just to make sure that, you know, people are maintaining, like you take good care of a dart frog, you can have it for 15 or 20 years. Um, even if this, the bioactive substrate is going to last four or five years for you, you're going to be changing that tank out four or five, six times. You know, maybe early on you make a mistake and overwater and you change it out sooner. Um, you know, you're going to be buying materials to culture fruit flies from us twice a year or so, or, you know, we can send a fruit fly culture to you every week if you want. So there's a lot of those, those costs just as taking care of those animals over their time span. Um, and just making sure we're providing all that stuff so they can live not only a, a life that's like, um, you know, they're, they're doing well, a low stress environment, um, you know, they're growing, they're possibly breeding depending on mm -hmm. our customer, but they're also showing some of that longevity, which more often than not exceeds what they'd see in the wild. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, you've hinted at it a little bit, um, about our conservation efforts. We, we talk a little bit more in depth, talk about, the the grants and talk about some of our ongoing programs that we have that impact the, uh, native populations of some of these animals. Cool. Um, this is probably one of my favorite parts of my job. And I was so thrilled when we like decided to move forward with this. Um, basically we have annual amphibian conservation grants. Um, those are basically push out, um, through various scientific publications, um, through a lot of colleges and universities, uh, research partners. And we have grants anywhere from, um, I think our top grant, if I'm not mistaken, is, uh, $2,500 all the way down to $500 grants. And, um, they are right now they're focused on in situ conservation or research of amphibians. So it needs to be in the wild in the amphibians, natural habitat, and either you're conserving those species or you're learning about them with the idea of learning about them is going to help conserve them and keep them around for future generations to enjoy. Uh, so we give those out. We work with partners. Um, there's a fun interview process because we want to keep customers up to date on it. And it's really neat because a lot of these people have become friends over time. Mm -hmm. um, our relationship with Sam Sucre originally was back when he was involved with EVAC um, in uh, LVL. Um, it's a Fibian conservation organization in Panama. Like, really, if you haven't seen it, check it out. They actually take, like, 40-foot shipping containers, turn them into what they call frog pods and breed frogs in Panama for, to learn about them and re-release and stuff. It's a really cool conservation project. But um, a lot of those become relationships where, like, we find out, like, with Sam, we were able to find out, um, man, during the pandemic, like, he really got hit with a lot of funding to where he'd even opened up a pet store to try to help support himself in some of his work. And we were able to partner with him in that and then also partner with him, like, hey, you can can we figure out an ethical way for you to produce animals and get in there? So now he sustainably has, like, a source of income that's also supporting these animals in the wild. Um, there's others like Brian Kabicki in Costa Rica or the um, um, it's Association Mitsinju in Andasa Bay, Madagascar, where you know we link certain cells in these sales, in this case retail sales of lemur tree frogs or mantellas, to where we sell a frog, we tally them up at the end of the year. Every time we sell a frog at retail, we, we basically factor up $5 and they're able to donate that money back to them. And in some cases that's like, I know with Brian, especially after the pandemic, that helped him like, um, basically reinvigorate a local breeding pond that frogs used to be breeding in that got clogged with debris. It was actually used to help um, uh, hire uh, locals who were without jobs at that time because the tourist industry and stuff had really dried up. Um, in Madagascar, it's a not insignificant part of their operating budget, and they were even using that to help uh, train locals and giving them real-life job skills to monitor for amphibians, uh, make sure their populations are doing well, as well as support their biosecure facility where they're actually reproducing these amphibians and, you know, help learning how to help them survive, which is really cool. That's cool. That's cool. All okay. right. Thank you, Zach, for answering those questions. I got uh, one last thing I want to do a lightning round with you that I'm going to gotcha. do with all the, the guests. And so I'm going to go through these questions. If you first thing that comes to your mind, just throw it out there. It doesn't have to be the right answer, wrong answer. I'm just going to hit you with a bunch of lightning round questions. Are you ready? Go. All right. If money and space were no issue, what's your dream pet? Pass. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, a dream pet, anything like that, that would be incredibly hard to answer. I'd replicate an environment. I'd take like a large portion, like a large greenhouse or something and try to build like a microcosm of something um, in a way that allowed for easy observation and then tried to manage those animals that lived in there in a way where they could actually be genetically valuable for either re-release or establishing captive populations in zoos and those facilities. That's cool. That's cool. All right. Besides Josh's frogs, what is one brand in our hobby that's really doing great work, either quality products, quality animals? Who, who do you want to give um, a shout out to? I've been really excited and pleased to just work with our development and seeing like what Natural Tanks is doing. Um, they're really cool um, in lines with those. It's the same vein as like Tesseros or Wikiri where they're really working to produce, you know, healthy animals, get animals and figure out an ethical way to bring captive animals, you know, uh, to the pet trade um, in a way that actually supports and funds those animals in a wild too. Cool. What was your first pet? 
My first pet was a dog named Chelsea, and it was a cocker spaniel. And my first reptile pet was Ryan a ribbon snake, and he's a baller. So, <laughs> all right, what did you want to be when you were a kid? Totally wanted to be a paleontologist. I wanted to dig up dinosaurs. I have a lot of fossils and stuff at home. When my wife and I got married, we actually had to merge our rock collections. I knew it was it was a sign then. Um, someday, <laughs> I'm still going to dig up dinosaurs, but probably like just on vacation or something like that. It's just super cool. I'm sure a lot of our uh, listeners can relate to merging fossil uh, collections together when they got married. That, that sounds like a, a common occurrence. Yeah. All right. Well, if you um, had an hour of free time, what would you spend it doing? Uh, reading, without a doubt. Uh, last night I was reading a 1940s uh, book about an animal collector. It's really interesting to put historical context into, um, into the trade and like where we've been and kind of that somehow informs like where we're going and also how others view us. And then I also spent some time reading, uh, we, my daughter and I started our first chapter book, um, 20,000 Leagues Beneath the Sea with Jewel Byrne last night. So we read nice. four chapters. So nice. That was good. Um, if you had a bunch of people listening to you if, you, if you had the ear of everybody, what, what's one thing that you would say to them? Um, beyond listening to this podcast, they, they should absolutely continue <laughs> listening to this podcast. Um, I would just say, and I'm assuming these are people who are listening, who are interested in owning animals or already do, uh, really take in consideration the source of your animals. Um, you know, price is great. Um, there's a lot of great options for captive bred animals out there. We're by no means the only one, but like just really look into the source and like how those animals are produced or acquired and how they enter the trade. Um, and just that ethical, that background from it. And cool. Can you keep those animals in a way and still at the same time help them out in the wild? Cool. Last question. What's your favorite animal or plant um, in the whole world? What's your favorite? If I say plant, the animal department's going to be upset with me. <laughs> and if I say animal, uh, if I had to, um, there's a ton of them. That's incredibly hard. My first dart frog were Luke's and Dender Baby's Luca I was able to, uh, they originally got them from Cindy Dickin back and she had a, a small um, company in Texas called Vivarium Concepts, like in the early 2000s. Um, Awesome group dart frog, nice loud call, bold, easy to breed. They won't beat each other up regardless of what sex they are. They're fun. Cool. Cool. Awesome, Zach. Thanks a lot for uh, being on the podcast. I really appreciate you painting a picture of the animal breeding facility and uh, other operations that happen here at Josh's Frogs. So thanks for coming on. Uh, um, if anybody has any questions or anything like that, um, I'm sure they can reach out to you. Uh, you're not on social media anymore, but uh, emailing us here at Josh's Frogs um, be a good way to get a hold of uh, Zach if you have any ideas. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. If you enjoy this content and want to stay up to date, make sure to like, subscribe, and follow us across social media. We always want to bring you the best content, so let us know if you, what you think in the comments. And for all your reptile and amphibian needs, be sure to check us out at joshesfrogs.com. We have an amazing selection. Until next time, stay curious, stay froggy, and keep exploring.